Museum on <coughs> Epigenetics and Evolutionary Processes, organized by myself and Christina Richards at University of South Florida. Uh, Christina could not be here, so um, I'm carrying the torch for both of us. Um, at the Evolution Meetings this year, uh, you've seen more epigenetics than probably you've seen in the previous Evolution Meetings. There were uh, two sessions on epigenetics. We have the SSE-sponsored symposium on epigenetics. Uh, and I'm going to take the next 15 minutes here uh, to hopefully convince you uh, why you should be interested in epigenetics and evolutionary processes. Uh, epigenetics is defined as phenomena that cause chromatin modifications and have the potential to affect gene function in the absence of changes to DNA sequence. So we're talking about changes in gene expression uh, that can cause changes to the phenotype. Uh, that are underlying by uh, changes uh, to the chromatin where there has not been any change to the underlying nucleotide sequences. Uh, here are the main examples of epigenetic mechanisms that are of intensive uh, research study within a lot of different subdisciplines in biology. Uh, DNA methylation, RNA methylation, modifications to histones, also short interfering RNAs. We're going to hear a lot today uh, specifically about DNA methylation and uh, epigenetic mechanisms. Uh, one comment uh, that we hear when we work on epigenetics, uh, especially since you're talking about changes to the phenotype, changes in gene expression and changes to the phenotype that are not underlain by changes in nucleotide sequences, is epigenetics just phenotypic plasticity? Uh, and the answer to that is no. And I'm going to convince you of why that is. Uh, some things are phenotypic plasticity that are not epigenetics. And some things are epigenetics that are not phenotypic plasticity. So let's take these one at a time. Uh, getting back to fundamentals, uh, here at an evolutionary biology meeting, we're interested in variation because variation is the, is the fuel of evolutionary change. Uh, and so if we're dealing with uh, 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 continuously distributed traits, we can decompose the total variation in a trait uh, as a function of genetic variation, environmental variation, uh, the uh, genetic by environmental variation, uh, and then we have a term here for all the residual variation, so you can decompose this model further into other terms. Uh, for example, if there's a covariance between uh, uh, the genotype and environment, you can add that in as another term, so on and so forth. Uh, so you can decompose phenotypic variation that way. Um, let's talk about the phenotypic plasticity components of that equation. First of all, uh, phenotypic plasticity, you, there, there are two different uh, parts to it. I'm showing you phenotypic plasticity here on this reaction norm graph. Uh, it's when you have the same individual, uh, or you could say the same genotype, the same strain, uh, in different environments expressing different phenotypes. So for example, this, this uh, red individual here, uh, genotype 1 uh, has one phenotype in one environment, a higher phenotype in the other environment. Uh, this genotype 3 has a contrasting pattern where it has the high phenotype in this environment, the low phenotype in the other environment. Uh, uh, genotype 2 is unresponsive to this environmental variation. Uh, that's phenotypic plasticity when you see that, uh, if, when you see that, in, uh, that um, difference in the phenotype according to the environment and that varies between strains. That's one form of phenotypic plasticity. This is also phenotypic plasticity. In this case, all three of the genotypes, genotypes 1, 2, and 3, respond uh, to the environment in terms of their phenotype. They all do it in the same way, but that's also phenotypic plasticity. And the consequence of this is that those two examples I showed you on that graph fit into two different parts of the quantitative genetic equation. Uh, the environmental variance is phenotypic plasticity, and the genetic by environmental variance uh, also contains phenotypic plasticity. So keep that in mind. That's where phenotypic plasticity lives in the quantitative genetics equation. But not everything that is phenotypic plasticity is epigenetics. For example, imagine you have a plant that grows bigger under warmer temperatures. To the extent that the plant is growing bigger under warmer temperatures because it, it grows faster, there's more cell division, so there's just more total cells. There might not be uh, differences in gene expression. It might just be that, to a certain extent, there's just more cells there, and that's why the plant is larger. Uh, 
Uh, it could also be that under warmer temperatures, the plant is growing faster because uh, um, enzymatic reactions happen at a faster pace. So that there's, there's no change in gene expression, it's just uh, some reactions are happening faster, allowing the plant to grow bigger. To the extent that those sorts of mechanisms are going on, you have phenotypic plasticity, but not epigenetics. On the other hand, let's get to the second part of this. Some things are epigenetics that are not phenotypic plasticity. Let's talk uh, to address this. Let's talk about the breeder's equation uh, uh, showing the uh, response to selection, microevolutionary change, as a function of the heritability of a trait and the uh, strength of selection on that trait. Let's talk a little bit more about how heritability is calculated. Uh, you typically do this by calculating the phenotype of the parents. You find the, uh, uh, the average value of the phenotype of the parents. You compare that to the phenotype offspring, and the uh, closer the relationship between the phenotype of the parents and the phenotype of the offspring, the higher the heritability. The heritability is going from 0 to 1, uh, as, as we all know. Um, but here's the crucial point. There's more, when you're thinking about the, what contributes to the similarity between parents and offsprings, there's more than just similarity in nucleotide sequences that's contributing to the phenotypic similarity between the parents and the offsprings. There's also, uh, to an extent, epigenetic mechanisms, the ones that are inherited, that can also be accounting for the similarity between the parents and their offspring. And again, that's where you calculate heritability. So epigenetics is baked into the calculation of heritability. And of course, we can calculate heritability in terms of the, the broad sense, where we're talking about total genetic variance divided by phenotypic variance, or we can calculate heritability in terms of the narrow sense, where we're talking about a particular component of the total genetic variance. Uh, but in, in any, in, no matter how you calculate it, epigenetics is a component of that calculation. And so what I hope I've proved to you is that epigenetics is a component of all the major terms in the quantitative genetics equation. These two terms here are phenotypic plasticity. Uh, genetic variance, that term is not. Epigenetics is in all three of those components. So everything that is epigenetics, so epigenetics is more than just phenotypic plasticity. And here's what really becomes important um, in terms of uh, explaining phenotypic variation. Let's say that we find that a trait has high heritability. One of the methods that we use to understand the, the basis of that heritability is by doing some sort of a genetic association study or a QTL mapping study of some sort, where we look for associations between uh, uh, nu nucleotide DNA polymorphisms and uh, uh, variation in the phenotype of interest, uh, as, as in this example here with root morphology. But what about epigenetics? Some of that variation of the phenotype, and then some of that heritable variation of the phenotype could also be due to epigenetic mechanisms. And by just scanning the genome looking at these nucleotide polymorphisms, we could be missing some of the contribution to that phenotypic variation that's accounted for by epigenetic mechanisms. Uh, and to drive that point home, I'd like to show you an example here on the screen. Uh, this is Cortillo et al. from 2014. Uh, this is uh, the results of some QTL mapping studies. We've got uh, using Arabidopsis thaliana. On the top here, this is the trait is flowering time. On the bottom here, the trait is uh, root morphology. And you can see that there's QTLs uh, that were significantly associated with flowering time and root morphology on various chromosomes. The recombinant in red line population upon which this QTL mapping study was performed is isogenic. So the only polymorphisms that are accounting for phenotypic variation in this study are epigenetic polymorphisms. So certainly epigenetic mechanisms can, can account for some of the heritability of the trait. Uh, Richards in 2006 recognized three different categories of epigenetic mechanisms uh, and epigenetic variation. And I think that this division is uh, very good heuristic 
There's obligatory epigenetic variation, uh, which from an evolutionary standpoint might be less interesting than the other two types. This is where the epigenotype is, is just a downstream read of the uh, DNA nucleotide sequences. So that whatever the nucleotide sequences are, there's a series of things that are set in motion that set up some epigenetic pattern. There's also uh, facilitate epigenetic variation, where there's some decoupling between the epigenotype and the uh, nucleotide-based genotype. So that uh, certain DNA sequences will favor certain epigenotypes uh, in, a, in a certain context, but it will be in a probabilistic manner. So you can't uh, necessarily predict with complete certitude that a particular DNA sequence is going to give you a particular epigenotype. There's other factors that are contributing to uh, the determination of the epigenotype. And then there's pure epigenetic variation. And these are epigenotypes that are generated stochastically or in response to environmental variation, completely independent of DNA sequences. Another important point, uh, there, folks have started documenting uh, uh, some molecular epigenetic mechanisms that account for phenotypic variation. Uh, and as this chart here summarizing uh, these mechanisms back in 2006 shows, some of these uh, epipolymorphisms that have been identified are stable, meaning that they're mitotically inherited and potentially also inherited into the germlines. So I hope I've convinced you that uh, epigenetics is something that should be on your radar screen uh, in evolutionary biology if it's not already. Uh, and uh, we've lined up a fantastic group of speakers here for you uh, from all over the world to talk about different aspects of epigenetics as they relate to evolutionary processes, uh, working on a variety of different taxa uh, that you can see listed up here. And I believe I have a minute left for questions before we get the main symposium speakers underway. Uh, so I'm happy to take a question or two. Yes, Sam. So, I don't disagree that uh, neuroplasticity is epigenetics, but I'm not quite sure. Well, actually, I would say uh, the way you've defined epigenetic processes. There's also epigenetics in that last term, in that, in that residual term, because if it truly is stochastic, then it's part of just developmental variability. Um, but then, I'll be provocative and say, yeah, this may tell us something about the particular genetic mechanisms, but is there anything about epigenetics that would actually alter an evolutionary model? as opposed to simply explaining what that term is in the model, what the, what the, what the molecular mechanism is, would, would the model itself and the dynamics of the model actually change with epigenetics? Well, epigenetic mechanisms don't behave the same way as nucleotide polymorphisms, for example. Uh, so whereas when you're talking about DNA mutations, those are generally unidirectional. Uh, with epigenetic polymorphisms, you can have a reversion back to the previous methylation state with some, with some frequency. There are old models that do exactly that. That's true, yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, main, the main important thing to keep in mind is that if we have blinders on and we're only looking at, for nucleotide variation to explain uh, these various phenomena, we're going to miss uh, some portion variation that's, that can, you can explain in these phenotypes. And then it's, it's also different from uh, the way that DNA works in the sense that you can have uh, epigenetic markers that are induced by the environment that can then also be stably inherited. And that's, and that's also a different process. So is, that what, is this going to change our models? Um, I mean, that's, that's yet to be determined. Uh, but it's, it's a mechanistic process that could be driving the phenotypic variation in the evolutionary change that we're seeing. So to the extent that we're interested in the, the underlying physiological and me mechanistic constraints on variation, this is a process that 
there's no reason that we should pay more attention to the nucleotide sequence variation than to the epipolymorphisms, if in fact they're both driving the uh, heritability and the phenotypic variation that we're seeing.